My name is Shiloh Maples. I'm Turtle Clan. I'm Anishinaabe. I'm a citizen of the Little River Band of Ottawa. I also belong to the Ojibwe people of Swan Creek and Black River. I'm speaking to you from my homelands here in the Great Lakes. Welcome to Spirit Plate. In this space, we will talk about indigenous food bays as means of resistance, resilience, and revitalization. Within this growing indigenous food movement, there is an incredible story of reclamation and intertribal solidarity. Powerful yet untold examples of native peoples resisting and thriving. The stories of our foodways are one of the greatest testaments of indigenous brilliance and our beauty of spirit. But before we can talk about indigenous people's food traditions, and contemporary efforts to revitalize their food systems, we have to understand the history of disruption that makes this work necessary. Today's episode is part two of our discussion on the allotment and assimilation era. During the last episode, we spoke to Eric Hemingway, the Director of Repatriation, Archives, and Records at the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Odawa, about the policies and events that took place throughout the allotment process and how those impacted Odawa relationships to land. Today, we're continuing this conversation with Eric to talk about Indian boarding schools and forced assimilation. Before we start this episode, I'd like to mention that the discussion of Indian boarding schools may be difficult to hear. There will be mentions of abuse towards children, so listeners who find these topics triggering may need to revisit this episode at a different time. We advise you to listen as you're able. If you find that you need to pause the episode now, We strongly encourage you to still check out the episode description to learn more about the crucial topics we're discussing today. Indian boarding schools have been in the news a lot more recently due to the uncovering of mass and unmarked graves across Canada and the U.S. But for those that aren't aware of these schools, can you explain what Indian boarding schools were? I can try. Yeah, this is is a tough one. This is probably the toughest piece of research that I do. I mean, I've been a professional historian for almost 20 years now, and this this one always is the toughest. But so essentially, Indian boarding schools are, again, this is in my historical interpretation, the formulation or the hardening of these assimilation policies. So the United States had what they call civilization policies towards natives, where they created a civilization fund act, they were giving money as a line item in the federal budgets to civilize Indians, to build churches and schools. And you see this idea of civilizing is written throughout treaties. So it's not just boarding schools. The boarding schools is part of a larger system of civilizing Indians. It just got fine-tuned, this policy to create the school. And the schools really began in in the 1880s. And these schools were throughout the country. There's to my knowledge, over 350 of these schools at one point. They operated in different times and different locations, but they were throughout the country. These schools were specifically for Native children. They varied in size. They varied in who ran them. Like Many of these schools were run by different Christian denominations, whether it's Catholic or Methodist. Some were what we call industrial government schools. All the administration was government officials. But at these religious schools, you know, they would receive the federal funding, but they be administered by the nuns and the priests there. But for all intents purposes, they were Indian boarding schools. So these schools started in the 1880s and they went throughout the country. And the main goal of these schools was to forcibly assimilate Native children into white culture. This was done through extraction of the kids. They would take them sometimes by force out of community. Sometimes it wasn't. There's a lot of different means on how kids got to schools. It's very complicated, a lot of moving parts. Some of these schools house hundreds of kids, some just dozens. They were obviously in Canada, but they were in Alaska. I think the largest concentration of schools was in Oklahoma, maybe California. But we had four of these schools in Michigan. And these schools were usually near large native population centers for obvious reasons. And the students either were boarders or day students. The boarders lived at the schools. And sometimes they would live at these schools for up to several years. And then the day students would go home at the end of the day like a normal school. But while at the school, it was very much focused on usually trade, like learning industrial skills, basic reading and arithmetic. They weren't prepping these kids to be doctors and lawyers and so on and so forth. They were prepping them to go right into the workforce 
but also they were focusing on making sure that the nativeness, the Indianness, was being extracted out. And the goal was to get kids at a younger age so you could essentially train them or keep them from becoming native. So the language was forbidden, traditions, culture. If kids arrived in a traditional dress that was stripped away and they were put into uniforms, the hair was cut, oftentimes shaved. And some of these schools were run in a military fashion. Most of them, from my research, were very strict military or not. It depended on school to school and also student to student. I've heard of experiences of students who did not have bad experiences. But then I read certain interviews and talked to people who had devastating experiences. Sometimes both of these kids could be at the same school. So I don't want to focus on the individual experiences because that's for the survivors to tell because we do have survivors still with us in northern Michigan. So that's not my story. You know, that's their story. I want to focus on the system that created the school. What created this system that would place these kids there in the first place? And this was about civilizing the savages. It just became this hardened institution by the 1880s. And the individual that's credited with creating the boarding school system was Richard Pratt. He was, for all intents and purposes, an Indian fighter. He actually fought against tribes on the plains. In his later years in his career with the military, he was overseeing basically a prison camp down in Florida of natives. And this is where he got the idea that if you have individuals in these institutions long enough, you can start to enforce your will on them, essentially. And if you get kids, then you're going to grab them before they learn their language, they learn their customs, learn their traditions, and they will be brought up non-native. And it's spread throughout the country. Like I said, there's over 350 of these schools. While at the schools, these kids were oftentimes treated very roughly, very strict discipline. But these schools, they were near usually reservations or where Native people lived. We had four of them in Michigan, one in Barraga, one in Harbor Springs, one in Mount Pleasant, one down by St. Joseph. One of the last boarding schools to close in the entire country was Holy Childhood of Jesus Indian Boarding School in Harbor Springs. So right where I live, I grew up in Cross Village, but I live in Harbor Springs. I, I remember seeing the school as a kid. It was torn down in 2007, and the legacy reverberates to this very day. And this is across the board for all boarding schools, all communities where people ask, how come you don't speak your language? How come you don't have all these traditions? And I simply say, you know, it's been taken out of my community for over a century that these people didn't have the opportunity to pass it on to their kids. It only takes one or two generations to lose these things. You have to pass them on. So these boarding schools are well known within native communities, but yeah, you're right. We're starting to see more widespread awareness to the schools with these horrific discoveries in Canada, but those those discoveries aren't, you know, relegated just for Canada. They're here in the United States as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of that and helping us to better understand what these schools were like and kind of what the purpose of the schools were. I am very familiar with boarding schools myself because my great grandparents were at the boarding school in Mount Pleasant here in Michigan. And my grandma's generation attended the school in Harbor Springs. And so I'm, I'm very familiar with these stories myself. I recently read some accounts that towards the end of the Great Depression, there were many families who tried to enroll their children into these schools because they would have clothing, food, shelter to survive, when at home these necessities may not have been guaranteed. And at other times, children end up these schools because they were orphaned. And in a sense, these schools became kind of a de facto orphanage for children that had nowhere else to go. But as you said, there are a lot of different reasons and ways that children ended up at these Indian boarding schools. I know, too, that there are many families that did not want to send their children to these institutions. Do you happen to know what were the consequences for Native families that resisted sending their children? In some records that I've read, and this is across the country, you know, that funding would be restricted to certain communities because they didn't meet a certain quota of kids that went to the school. So this federal funding would, you know, affect food or resources. I'm not saying every community had this, but some did. And then there's always the stories of, you know, the snatch and grab where they would actually grab kids and put them in these schools. And I've heard of this in Alaska where these kids were literally taken from their communities. And 
I'm seeing this economic pressure that you just mentioned, like especially during the Depression era, that families were literally starving and you had to make a hard choice of who eats. And so if one of the older kids could go to a boarding school, at least you know they would be fed to some degree and it takes some of the weight off the parents. So I see that. But then I also have heard stories about social services getting really heavy-handed with its decision-making with Native families where they would come in and deem that a, a household is unkept, there's negligence, the parent is unfit, and they would force these kids to go into these schools. Or the alternative would be, we're going to take these kids and put them in foster care and you won't see them. So there's a lot of different mechanisms and how these kids ended up there. But yeah, for sure, I've read different accounts where the economic pressure, especially depression era, was just so intense. People are literally starving and you have to make a decision. But also I see that the societal pressure too, that it was just expected that the Indian kids go to the Indian schools and they weren't exactly welcomed in public schools. They weren't exactly recruited to go to public schools. And that was just the way it was. My dad went to a boarding school. It's expected I go to the boarding school and my kid will go to the boarding school. I'm starting to see more of that in how kids ended up at this place, especially in the early 1900s. I mean, I think it was just this expectation. And whether your kid, if you're in, in Odawa from Northern Michigan, if they go to Holy Childhood or Mount Pleasant, I mean, I've seen a lot of kids that went to Mount Pleasant who are from Charlevoix County. You know, I was going through these records last week and I found my great uncle, Titus, and I didn't know he went to that school in 1918. He was my great uncle through marriage. He was married to my great aunt. But I knew Titus as a kid. I remember going to Gladys and Titus's home in Charlevoix as a really young four or five years old. So again, like how you have Shell, this personal connection, you know, you start seeing family members. How did they get there? You know, why were they going here? And it's just all these questions I have. They're starting to be answered slowly, but there's the point I want to stress, there isn't one simple answer that covers all of this. You know, some kids are there because their families want them to go there. They have good experiences, so they send their kids there. Some kids are forced through social services. Some are, are forced through economic problems. I found a, a piece of evidence in 1918 that the public high school here in Harbor Springs was renovated. And in that year, they had a tuition fee of $25. So in 1918, who has $25 for their kid for school? That's big money. So what do you do? You either go to one of the one-room schoolhouses or you go to the boarding school. I wonder if you could share just a little bit about the differences between what boys' and girls' education looked like at these institutions. So again, my focus is on mainly Holy Childhood. I, I mean, I've done a little research into Mount Pleasant and, and Carlisle because that's where the Odawa of Northern Michigan went. So in doing the research for this, I'm seeing Odawa kids who went to Holy Childhood. They went to Mount Pleasant. They went to Carlisle. They went to Genoa, Nebraska. They went to Haskell. They went to, um, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Ch Chicago, out in Oklahoma. So they went all over the country. From what I've seen, the work is definitely assigned by gender. So boys are learning the skills of the day, whether you're being a cobbler, whether you're being a carpenter. The girls were being taught seamstress, what they called the husbandry skills, cooking and cleaning. And then everybody was taught, you know, your basic reading and writing and arithmetic. Yeah. And I've recently read some accounts that talked about instead of children visiting their families during school breaks, that it was somewhat common for these schools to lend out students, even very young children, to nearby farms and households to continue their, quote, domestic education or their immersion learning. No, I've read that too, Shiloh, where some of the kids would go to farms or homes and work. And this might be under the guise of continuing their education, but a lot of times it was to generate revenue to keep the schools open. A lot of these schools started to close in the 19 teens and 20s. Carlisle was the largest, most you know, well-known school and it closed in the 1920s. And so when Carlisle closed, and what I'm seeing a lot of these other schools started to follow suit. There was a change in ideas and administration. Not that they thought that civilizing natives was a bad, there's still this idea that natives need to be civilized, but the school system itself was flawed. 
and it was expensive. When the rubber met the road, it was about funds. The general attitude at the time was that Native people were, quote, good human material, but that being raised in our cultures had limited our people's ability to succeed in mainstream society. In accounts from survivors of the Mount Pleasant Indian Boarding School, they shared this passage that they used to say, Six o'clock in the morning, our breakfast comes around. A bowl of mush and molasses was enough to knock you down. Our coffee's like tobacco juice, our bread is hard and stale, and that's the way they treat you at Mount Pleasant Indian Jail. Instead of children visiting their families during school breaks, I've heard that it was quite common that these schools would lend out students, even very young children, to nearby farms and households to continue their domestic education. The government didn't want to fund all these schools. They were really expensive. But Holy Childhood, up in Harbor Springs, kept operating for decades after federal funding was pulled. And they did so through a whole plethora of means, whether it's having kids work, donations, fundraisers. So yeah, I've seen these accounts. It's a little bit disturbing. Well, there's a lot that's disturbing to me about the boarding school system. But that's one of the things that really sticks is these kids, you know, five, six, seven years old, they're working really, really hard. And some of these photos I see, these young boys are cutting wood with, you know, they don't have chainsaws back then. It's all horses and cross-cut saws and, and axes. You know, they're out in wintertime cutting wood. They're doing so to raise revenue and also keep the school fueled. But it's just a pretty telling photo when there's these young boys, not young men, young boys, you know, doing this really arduous labor in winter. So they were expected to work. Yeah, something related to that that I often think about is when it comes to the boarding schools is how if these children were raised in their home communities, they would have received this really rich land-based education from their parents, grandparents, everyone around them. These schools really disrupted the intergenerational transmission of a lot of our traditional knowledge. One thing, you know, as I was starting to do my own self-education, specifically around the institutions, the boarding schools here in Michigan, to learn more about my own family's possible experience. I found an article that told a story of a student that attempted to burn down the school. Do you carry any particular stories like this of students resisting? I think I know what story you're talking about. Was it in Mount Pleasant? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I seen that newspaper article and and she wasn't a young girl. She was, I think, a teen. So there's a lot that can be uh, extrapolated from that one article. What was going on? What what prompted it? She said it was, in the article, like being mischievous or something. But eh, there's more than being mischievous going on. She probably experienced something pretty horrific. So, yeah, you see a lot of acts of resistance. A lot of these end tragically, though. And I'm seeing more and more newspaper articles about kids who run away. I guess that's the ultimate act of resistance is just to, to leave. But a lot of these kids don't make it back home. They actually perish on their attempts to get home. We have these newspaper articles from the 1940s where these young boys leave Holy Childhood and one of them freezes to death just north of Cross Village. They literally have a 100-mile walk to get home and they have to cross the straits. And this is before the Mackinac Bridge is even built. So how they're going to walk on the ice if they can make it and then walk all the way to the western end of the UP. They're going to do this. And it's in the middle of February. It's the coldest, hardest month. And one of them doesn't make it. But we're seeing more and more. This is across the country. These kids trying to get back home. In the newspaper article, it just you know sums it up that this young young Indian boy was homesick. I'm like, no, there's, there's more going on than that. He's escaping. He, he's needing to get back home. So... That, to me, is one of the strongest forms of resistance is the runaway. Or, you know, I read these accounts where they just refuse to do the chores or just these little acts of defiance where they'll knock their hats off. Just little things. But mind you, these schools are, you know, Holy Child was very strict. So if you got out of the line too much, you're going to get beat. Not just smacked around, I mean beaten. So they were very mindful, you know. You can't push it too far. otherwise you're going to pay. There was a very cognizant effort to survive, to preserve. If you got out of line too bad, the nun or the priest would literally beat you and then lock you in a room with no food and 
no blankets. And so there's serious repercussions for your actions. But also, in my mind, you know, just them surviving is the act of resistance of just making it through the system. And a lot of these kids, you know, they kept their language as best they could and they would pass it on. And, you know, what traditions that they would have passed on. So there was that going on in secret. But um, yeah, that article about the girl trying to burn the school, I just read that two or three weeks ago. I just stumbled upon it. It really stood out. So I, I have just a couple more questions for you. You've spoken at different times about the long-term effects of these schools. How are communities dealing with this legacy today? How are they working to recover from what you've seen? You know, really, Shiloh, that's like a, that's such a broad question. It's so individual-based. I'm from a community, though, too, that's, it's different because the school closed so late. It's an anomaly in a lot of senses because we have so many people who went to Holy Childhood who are still with us in their 50s and 60s, not 80s or 90s. They're pretty young. So I feel like in this community, it's so different than other communities because you don't know who went to the school. You don't know what their experience was. And you, you could be talking to a Anishinaabe person and not have the slightest clue that they were at Holy Childhood because usually people don't divulge that. Why would they? So people are learning about it. People are also coming forward more, I'm seeing. You know, like you say, these stories are within the family, but a lot of times they don't leave the family. But I'm seeing more people becoming more, I don't want to say comfortable, but willing to share because it's time. I'm also seeing more people listening about this, largely in part because of Canada. It's just undeniable. You can't ignore what's going on there. And that reflects on here. But I, I'm really hesitant to say how tribes are responding or, or communities because it's so varied. I see some people who are just really angry and I get it. And then I see some people who are just really relieved that this is coming out and I get it. So it's just, a, I think, a question that has to be asked over and over through a large population. In your opinion, Eric, why is it important for us to share these stories? Because it's the truth. It happened. It's truth. It's honesty. It's something that directly and profoundly impacts a population today, not just one or two individuals, a population. And this truth is rooted in federal policy, federal actions. It wasn't one church creating a school and it spread or one army general. It was funded through federal money, federal ideologies and ideas. And it was longstanding. So I think it's important because it's a, a truism that is undeniable. You know, there's, there's so many different lines of evidence to say this is true. As You got the stories, you got the evidence, you got the people. And it explains a lot of how Native communities are today. There's language recovery and revitalization because of things like the boarding school. You know, we have to revitalize and reconstruct because it was systematically destroyed. We have this intergenerational trauma that's occurred from these schools that reverberates through communities. And you have loss of life. You know, we're seeing from the Canadian side that it's the same here. There's a lot of schools with a lot of kids around the schools. For all intent purposes, they're cemeteries. That impacts your community. So I think it's important because it's true, it happened and it didn't happen in one spot, Shiloh. It happened all over the United States. And it happened right in our own backyard in some cases like Harbor Springs. I live here. I walk my two doggies pretty much every day. And I walk past this place all the time. And it's right downtown. It's just a weird feeling going by there, knowing the stories. The school's gone. They tore it down in 2007. So if you went there today, you wouldn't know that that school was there. There's no marker, nothing. But course we know. And I know for a fact that there's still children around the, the church in that area. So that's part of the story. And it needs to come out. It needs to be told, is there ever a right time for something like this? There's no ideal time, but it has to come out. It has to be told. So I'm really defer that to, you know, to the survivors that were part of the system that are still with us. So yeah, it's it's tough. It's a really tough piece of history. I can read about and learn about, you know, the wars and diseases, which are horrific. But there's something about the school because it's kids. 
that touches on a, on a different different chord in a different way, and it's so recent. You know, I can read about a disease I went through in the 1830s, and it's it's still pretty recent, though. I mean, it's not a couple 200 years isn't a long in the scope of human history, but 20 years, 30 years ago, that's 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 my grandma. Yeah, yeah, I I completely know that myself. I have two more brief questions for you. I'd like to ask you a more personal question. Obviously, feel free to decline, but I'm curious what brought you to this work and what keeps you doing it. I ask myself that all the time. <laughs> like, what, 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 what brought you here? You know, why do you do this? Because, man, I, just to be, you asked a personal question, so I'll give a personal answer. It's been rough the last six months talking and listening to survivors, reading all of the letters and and these are letters not from the tribal communities, but from government officials, Indian agents, priests, just this language is just horrific that's used to describe my community. So why continue to do this? Because it needs to get done. It has to get done. I firmly believe that you're giving these opportunities or put in certain places at certain times for reasons. So for whatever reason, I'm here right now to do this and you do it. And so no matter how tough it gets and how emotional or angry or sad you manage th through this because you're doing something that creates awareness, it creates acknowledgement and also a base for the next person to come in and do more work. So I realize this work is gonna be beyond me and the next person will come in and build upon what I've done as part of this larger movement. So I always, you know, think down the road too that I, I won't read everything, I won't use everything, but maybe the next team will. And so you just gotta make sure it's there for them and in place. And I'm a firm believer in just getting the truth out there, no matter how ugly and insidious it might be, it's still the truth. I'd rather know than not know. If something happened in my community or my country or my backyard, I wanna know about this. Even if it's ugly, I want to know. So that drives a lot of my work and also my, my upbringing. You know, my mom, Peggy Hemingway, she's very involved in the tribe in the 1980s and early 1990s. She was on the first tribal council, tribal citizen. And we grew up dirt poor in Cross Village, but we were rich in community. And I was always around other Odawas and Anishinaabe people. And we were fighting for our treaty rights, fishing rights. We went and got reaffirmation, and we did something no other tribe had ever done, have our federal status as an Indian tribe reaffirmed through congressional legislation. And it was just a real magical time, real powerful time to see community, but also they were picking up the torch from previous generations. They didn't do this on their own by any means. They were just this long continuation of fighting for Anishinaabe rights. So as soon as I got my job here with the tribe, my mom said, well, what are you going to do with it? It's your turn to do something and use your job and your position accordingly. And that was 16 years ago. So I, I talked to my mom pretty regularly and let her know what's going on. And, and she's like, yeah, you're doing work. You're working. That's good. So that's part of the large reason why I do this. And also certain experiences touch you when you're doing the work. Part of my work for several years was repatriation and working to get ancestors out of museums. When you physically repatriate a person, no matter if it's a tooth or a skull or what have you, it changed, it changed me. You're honoring them and you're putting them back into the ground because without them, you wouldn't be here. And this is a continuation of that work of honoring ancestors, trying to find where these kids are. And if they're there, you know, what do you do? Try to, you know, work through the process. And then also working a lot with the public, doing exhibits, working with schools, working with parks. And I'm seeing a lot more that people who are non-native are wanting and needing to hear this history. So that's really encouraging. You know, some of my best partners are at the state and the National Park Service. And we develop exhibits and curriculums and just do programs and we don't shy away from it. So you see this encouraging interaction it's like a spark. It just keeps keeps it going. But how I got into it, I guess, is just being Anishinaabe, being from Cross Village and immersed in 
the community and never leaving. I mean, I moved around, but I never left. So always having those roots in Cross Village and in Waganuxing has been huge. I mean, I, I backpacked a lot in my 20s, I guess trying to find myself or escape winter or whatever. But at some point, it's like, this isn't home. Home is Cross Village. It's northern Michigan. I got to go back. And when I did, the job opened up, the door opened. And that's 16 years ago. Yeah, it's been good. It's tough. I mean, this last six months have been really tough. I mean, this has been one of the toughest stretches of work because you're hearing really tough stories, reading tough stuff. And like I said before, it's it's kids. That just resonates in a different way. And one of the most difficult repatriations I ever did was there was a young baby in the collection and we had to rebury that baby. So it's like you're, you keep going to these experiences that you have and they all, to me, interrelate on some level. So whether it's, you know, this child that we repatriated that was 2,000 years old, but they're from Michigan still. And then we go and try to find these kids from the boarding schools from 50, 100 years ago. It doesn't matter. It's these things that anchor you in, into your community. Thank you. Last question. Is there anything else you'd like our listeners to know? Native people are still here. <laughs> That's a big one. That Anishinaabe are still in their homeland to Gitchigumic, the Great Lakes. And that we're going forward. We're not being defined by all the bad that's happened. I don't want to be defined by the bad, but you can't ignore the bad. You got to tell the tough story, but don't have this tough story define you. So that's something I really try to stress in any of the the programming and, and work that I do. And that if you want to know about Native people, go talk to some Native people. <laughs> I mean, we're all over the place, really. It's We're not all tucked away on a reservation and... If you want to know about Native people, go to Native people and just learn from the source. So that's a big one, like today. So I really appreciate the opportunity to speak and share. Well, I just want to say miigwech. Thank you, Eric, for the work you do and for sharing this important history with us. It's been a real honor talking with you and learning from you. Thank you. Oh, no miigwech in return, Shiloh, for having the opportunity to share. Working together is so important. I always value anybody who opens up their professional space like this to story and history. I just am always in gratitude of that, whether it's a teacher or a park or a fellow Anishinaabe like yourself. So I just want to say miigwech for sharing your space. The Spirit Plate Podcast is an honoring of all the Indigenous communities across Turtle Island who are working to preserve and revitalize their ancestral foodways. In this space, we will talk about Indigenous foodways as means of resistance, resilience, and revitalization. Thank you for listening to Part 2 of Allotment and Assimilation, Episode 6 of Spirit Plate. We hope you enjoyed it. A big thank you to Eric Hemingway. You can learn more about Little Traverse Food Sovereignty work at ZBME Zhuang Farm and Native Food Market Minogan Market by visiting their website at zibimijuang.com. That is Z-I-I-B-I-M-I-J-W-A-N-G.com. You can subscribe to Spirit Play anywhere you get your podcasts, and we'll be back next week to talk about the era of Indian reorganization. Throughout Season 1, we'll discuss some of the social, political, and historical reasons why the Indigenous food sovereignty movement is necessary. A critical understanding of the journey that led us here needs to become a more common understanding before American society can give life to a new, more equitable food system. And a more equitable food system requires narrative equity. Indigenous people must get to define their own relationship to land and food and tell the stories of their work themselves. Through interviews with seed keepers, chefs, farmers, and community members, this podcast will share what food justice and sovereignty looks like for Indigenous peoples across Turtle Island. As your host, I'm inviting you to the table and into a deeper conversation. I hope that you'll be inspired to think about your own connection to place and how this has influenced your relationship to food. I also hope you'll feel moved to build genuine relationships with the original caretakers of the place you reside and consider how you can stand in solidarity with their communities. If you would like to learn which Indigenous communities' homeland you reside upon, visit native-land.ca. That is 
N-A-T-I-V-E dash L-A-N-D dot C-A. Spirit Plate is part of the Whetstone Radio Collective. Thank you to the Spirit Plate team, producer and music composer Kat Yang, audio editors Kat Salinas and Bethany Sands, researcher Giselle Kennedy-Lord, and intern Indigo Clarkson. I'd also like to thank Whetstone founder Stephen Satterfield, Whetstone Radio Collective executive producer Celine Glassier, sound engineer and music designer Max Cuddlechuck, associate producer Quentin LeBeau, production assistant Amelissa Utinko, and sound intern Simon Lavender. You can learn more about this podcast at whetstoneradio.com, at Instagram and Twitter at Whetstone Radio, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Whetstone Radio Collective, for more podcast video content. You can learn more about all things happening at Whetstone at whetstonemedia.com. Until next time, Bama P.